First of all, for full disclosure, of everyone in this room, I know the least about genetics. I just hang out with geneticists, okay? So don't be on that. And um, I look at all of this through the, uh, the uh, lens of oversight and IRB and escrows and those sorts of things. But I do hang out with a number of you. Uh, it's been a little daunting listening to some of the presentations yesterday and today on how, well, the panel, Pearl's panel is going to address this. And yeah, Pearl's panel will get to that. Um, I hate to disappoint, but um, our panel um, is Irwin, David, David, and Dan. These are the four smartest people here. The rest of you failed. Um, and what I'm going to do is just start us off with a few comments, and then actually um, David Chambers is going to go second because he has a, another meeting he has to go to. So the, this was a title, obviously, and I put up here the little style, and I think that you know, not only the political environment, but things are very polarized. And I think we, you, everyone here needs to sit back and realize how polarized. And when I was doing early on um, ECMO therapy, you know, one of the very smart men said to me, okay, the difference between clinical care and research is you get paid for doing clinical care and sued for not doing it, but this research, you don't get paid for doing it and you get sued for doing it. And I think, you know, this is obviously way too black and white, but I do think it's important to sit back and say, what are the boundaries? I mean, we're talking about navigating who are the boundaries. I think, first of all, purpose. You know, research is not for the individual. Um, and in fact, you know, your decision making is to get group data, not for, you know, me, Pearl, as a patient. Whereas clinical, obviously, is individual focused. I think as an aside, pediatricians make great geneticists because it's a family much more than it is just the, you know, the child. The type of information, and again, this is very, being very black and white, and I realize reality is more in the gray, but research data, discovery, it's interesting, it's not yet ready for prime time, is the usual response to that. Clinical, I think clinicians probably are overly accepting that what, they, what they're receiving from labs is truth, but they do have this concept, if I get a blood sugar of 300, something's wrong. Whether I'm in Boston or Detroit, something is wrong, and I know how to act. Rules of engagement. With research, it's an add-on. You do have some degree of oversight, um, be it the, con the IRB, uh, which is either going to do the common rule, if you're doing an FDA-regulated product, FDA regs. Um, IRB will determine whether or not you need consent or if it's a waiver situation. Whereas opposed for research, or for clinical care, there's been a lot of comments regarding consent. We do not get very much consent. At the end of coming into the hospital and promising you're going to pay, there's oftentimes a little thing, yeah, and they can do things to me, and oh, by the way, if there's leftover tissue, you can photograph it and do this and that. Um, some clinical procedures we get consent for. And my favorite is our surgical consent, where just, you know, they just told you how you, if you don't die from the surgery, you're going to die from the anesthesia. And oh, by the way, if there's something left over, can we use it? So I don't think we really have a robust system for even getting clinical care. And it's a huge variety between institutions. The other issue are the people who live on the different sides. We have extreme researchers who um, don't even know that blood comes from a person. Um, I mean, I can't begin. Why would any care? I wouldn't care. It's just blood. It's just DNA. I mean, it's just, you know, believe me, we get these. We also have, I think, a very large and growing population of people who are on the extreme of clinical care, be it clinicians, be it payers, be it your medical record IT people, and certainly administrators, who often have very little, if any, training in what research is. And they can recognize a researcher through binoculars at a distance, but they've never met one. And luckily, and I think where we have to focus are in the straddlers. These are not stragglers, they're straddlers. Um, and I suggest any of you Google a picture for straddling, and it's really, it's porno sites that come up. <laughs> I tried, but that's why you got the style in the fence. I couldn't find one. <laughs> So a little bit more on the inhabitants, the extreme researchers. What we are being told is whether or not you like it, this stuff is coming, so just get ready. That's kind of the feeling that clinicians are having. And even sitting here, you know, just get over it. These 10 things are just ready. Just get on and use it. Well, why isn't it being used? Oh, well, I'm not really sure. I mean, blah, 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 blah. 
But I think the, re the picture that a lot of people have in their minds of you folks is this. There are you guys creating all this incredible data, which you're so excited about. You have these expected results, and oh, by the way, we're up to our ankles in incidental findings, which may also be very exciting. Deal with it. Not fair, but I do think on one extreme, that is pushing a boundary. On the clinician side, again, extreme clinician, they're seeing this as total overpromise. Um, I love this term. Researchers uh, are victims of errors of enthusiasm. I can't tell you how many oh wows we have coming in from investigators. I just found this and I have to inform everyone. You know, ask about four questions, you know, what's the penetrance, what does it mean, what is this? And it's like, oh yeah, maybe I'm not right. And you know, off they scurry back until the next week. Um, a lot of us, you know, have friends and we say, so you know, what do you, do you think genetics is ready for, you know, coming into the clinic and everyone says, oh, I have all these friends and even they don't agree. Well, they should have been here. Listen to you guys, you don't agree. And the issue that any finding is too fluid. You know, a finding today, tomorrow you say, oh, you need these other four variants to really make that be effective. So I think all of these things kind of go into the concept that the data is not ready for prime time, so don't bother me. I think clinicians, too many other problems. We talked a lot about IT support for getting this in, and I think it's incredibly important. Our clinicians cannot have a single IT system where they can find an X-ray and the ER visit data in one place. So the idea of bringing in a whole genome sequence, you know, you gotta be shitting me, I'd rather find the x-ray. <laughs> okay, except where, except Dan has that, but everyone else doesn't. Okay. <laughs> no, but I think it is the concept that, you know, not only within a single institution, and Lord knows partners is kind of like the balkanized Soviet states with walls around each institution, but it's also our mobile patient population. We cannot find everything. And I think, and another thing of making the, quote, patient be responsible, that's a whole different approach to medicine, which, I mean, we can't just say, you're in charge of your whole genome, you know, it's your DNA, here, hold it. We don't ask them to hold their blood pressure, you know, or their data, or their, what was your last blood sugar? So, or the blood type, yeah, but we keep redoing it. <laughs> so I think, you know, that's another thing we have to think about. And I think a lot of clinicians will say, when I have to do it, I will be told. It'll be a mandate from somebody. I also think, interestingly, I think the public is more enthusiastic about this than our clinicians. I don't think the whole public, but I think both direct-to-consumer uh, genetic testing, I think a lot of the press, I think some of the overpromise does actually make the patient population more enthusiastic. So when we talk about the boundaries, I think obviously important, we need a loop. It's not just getting stuff from research into the clinic, but it's getting the outcomes in the clinic back into the research. And I think if we don't have this whole loop, um, we're just gonna, you know, a lot of the ideas are gonna be dead in the water. So I am proposing that we need more straddlers. I think we need researchers who can talk with, go to Christmas parties with clinicians, who understand how does stuff get into the clinic, what is validity, be it analytic or clinical, you know, what is utility, um, recognize clinicians as more partners rather than someone who can draw blood. I think clinicians, obviously, everything I said in the other direction. I don't think we understand how clinical systems adopt new technologies. And while I think this is a humongo technology to adopt, I think we need to better understand how, why are all systems coming at this differently? The IT systems, um, I mean, there's not enough IT specialists in the world to do this. But I think we do need a system that can capture the data we want. If it's, I, I truly think we need a single system that can have both clinical and research information, but that somehow respects it. And I think a number of comments were made here before that as soon as it's on the medical record side, that goes to whomever can get the medical record, i.e. your insurers. Um, what do you do with the patient or the individual who says, I don't want anyone knowing I was in this research protocol? We have a few of those. Um, you know, do you say sorry, but it's going to be there? Anyway, so I think the IT space needs a lot of work, and I think we need to better understand how payers endorse new um, stuff, so to speak. And I think we've had some allusions to uh, insurers, et cetera. The public. I think we are in a very weird time right now with the public. Um, and some of these are quotes I've heard here. Um, 
a lot of people are saying, why do those IRBs always insist on all those consent forms for every time there's a new thing, another consent form? And my patients are saying, just use my stuff. You're harassing me with all these consent forms. I agree. I think that's probably 85% of the population. They, you know, they want to help. They want to be good citizens. And here, use my stuff. But there is, I think, an increasing, what I call more egocentric model. And I think the um, activities that have supported this have been the Havasupai situation, um, the Henrietta Lacks, uh, Immortal Life of Henrietta, Henrietta Lacks book that came out, and look what's happening with neonatal blood spots. Not exactly good citizens of the world approaches, certainly with the blood spots. I think we are seeing increasing number of uh, participants. Again, I don't think it's the majority, but I think it is a growing group that want to control not only how their stuff is used, but who uses it. We have, unfortunately, our biggest area of, of um, subjects saying no, at least in terms of banking and data use, is they don't want to share anything with the federal government. So when we put in the GWAS piece and say, oh, by the way, it's going to be coded and sent to the feds, no, I'm not going in. That is our most common. Um, there's the expectation of return of research results. We have some who want the hard data. Um, again, and again, that's not new to genetics, but it's certainly it's the amount of information coming in is making it a more a bigger issue. And they want payment. You know, you have my DNA. What are you going to do with it? What if you make a million dollars from it? I should get that. And if you haven't read The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Re Rebecca Skloot, you really should. In that, in there's, there's one of the concepts that gets uh, addressed is, you know, if you get specimens from a thousand people and only one of them actually was at the oh wow from which you could make some kind of product to make a huge profit, does that person get the million dollars? Do all thousand get you know a buck fifty? And I mean, these are discussions that are going on. And I just had to say a few things on the regulatory. And this is my last slide. But the common rule, which is the rule that tells IRBs how they have to work, was written in the 70s. And it suffers from incredible time warp. And there is this advance notice of proposed rulemaking, which came out this summer, which um, is attacking it at a gazillion, in, in a number of ways. And I'm not sure what's going to happen with this. For the, you, know, you do an advance notice, and then everybody comments. It got over 1,000 comments. Many of them, I'm sure, were two words, which I won't quote here. Um, <laughs> many were, I mean, we send in 50 pages of comments. I mean, this, this advance notice was so inclusive of so many details. They then will have to come back and give a notice of proposed rulemaking, which will then be open for comment. And then it could potentially go to actually be a rule. Um, we have heard from some folks that the initial goal was to get this done before the presidential election, which I think that, I, I, I personally do not say, I think that's too rapid a time span. But if you have not looked at this, really do talk to folks in your institution. For genetics, one of the, two of the issues that are of particular concern, I feel, are identifiability of tissue. They make the statement that tissue is identifiable. Okay? Well, that does change things. HIPAA so far says tissue is not identifiable unless it's linked to the information. It will not take HIPAA long to realize this one, and this opens up a whole new world. The other issue is that they are proposing a requirement of a new mini consent, which is supposed to be very, very short consent, but that will be required before you use data or tissue. Now, for us, I can tell you we have um, a large number of research protocols going on under which we have waiver of informed consent. In other words, the IRB, if, you, if there are particular criteria that are met, it's not practicable, it's you know, less than minimal risk, you can say, okay, fine, go ahead, we'll waive informed consent. Not doable. Tissue, because it's now all identifiable, no longer can you say, well, I'll just get de-identified tissue specimens and go and have a nice day. Not possible. So if this actually were to go through in the way it currently sits, it would be a huge change, require huge changes for, for all of us. Um, and anyone who wants to know more about this later would be happy to tell you. There's, they do one good thing, but that's it. Um, lack of standardization between the common rule, FDA regs, and HIPAA. We have to work with different definitions of identifiability. Um, there's others also. Lack of guidance from the feds on, quote, genetics. This has really driven IRBs nuts. 
in that there's a, you know, a cacophony of opinions, both from our geneticists and from our basic researchers in terms of return of research results, what to tell, what not to tell. And then add to this the fact that from a federal level, we really have had a hard time, I think, getting easy and understandable guidance from particularly OHRP regarding what is genetic risk. I do allow, there are some small IRBs, if genetics in the title, they will require a full IRB review rather than doing expedite, and that's just nuts. Um, they aren't even looking at like, they mean one SNP or a whole genome, oh, said genetics. Um, so again, I think we need a lot of help in this area. And I would also suggest you keep your eye on HIPAA and high tech. Um, what is becoming more and more difficult is the high tech, the concept of breach. There are suggestions out, there's proposals in here that are, have been recently put out by the Office of Civil Rights, which oversees HIPAA, um, that every time anyone goes into a chart, you have to document who went in, even for care even for research within your own institution, so that I as a patient could come back and say, I want to see everybody who's been in my chart. And there's going to be Scott Weiss was in it 58 times on one Saturday afternoon, and it's going to have his name as in why he, I mean, I know I'm interesting, but not that interesting. So I just wanted to kind of put out, I think, the importance as we talk about navigating the boundaries. We got to know what the boundaries are. And I think for a lot of the suggested approaches here, I think do address some of these, but I do think there's a bigger gap between your routine clinician and genetic researchers. Um, and I do not think they're ready for a lot of the conversations that you're having here. The fact that, you know, people saying in what, six years, you, I can't find the person who said that, you know, we had three genetic consults. Yeah, they're ready for the whole genome at your institution. Yeah. Okay, so I will, David, if you want to make a few comments up here and uh, we do have comments from four people, and then obviously it's open for everything, and we have been foreshortened to 45 minutes. Correct, Terry? Okay. Okay, so uh, 